Hello mind mappers and welcome to the video. Today we're going to be going over Fail Fast, Fail Often by Ryan Babineau and John Crumbles. How losing can help you win. If you're the type of person that has trouble taking action in their life, or when you're setting goals, if you feel you're always stuck in the planning stage, this book is going to be perfect for you. Without any further ado, let's get directly into the introduction. Fail Fast, Fail Often. Here's a quote that I pulled out that I believe gives us a good overview of what we can expect to learn today. The point of this book is to help you take action in your life. You might think of this as Action 101, because we teach the basics of getting going and making things happen, even though you may feel apprehensive, unprepared, or afraid of failure. The ideas presented here arose out of our work as career counselors and educators. In talking to thousands of individuals about their work, we made an important discovery. People who are happy and successful spend less time planning and more time acting. They get out into the world and try new things, make mistakes, and in doing so, benefit from unexpected experiences and opportunities. In the following pages, you will find advice on how to follow your interests and take action. Even though you may be unsure of your career plans or you feel stuck in a rut, or you may be apprehensive of failure. We provide practical advice on how to trust your enthusiasm and allow it to guide you. Break free from habitual behaviors and initiate new adventures. Act boldly with minimal preparation and leverage your strengths for rapid change. Each chapter includes a discussion of cutting edge research, inspiring stories from the lives of famous and ordinary people alike, and specific steps to put ideas into practice to enact immediate change in your life. So really, this is kind of our welcome to Action 101, kind of the masterclass of action. Our guides here today, well, two leading psychologists and career counselors. This book is based on a course that they taught in Stanford University called Fail Fast, Fail Often, a course taken by thousands of students, and as they said, based specifically on research. And the book includes some really great stories of famous and ordinary people, and of course, the action steps that have been Kind of a trademark of our mind maps. So what's this course all about? Well, inside the course, they make the argument that the happiest and most successful people have a bias towards action in their lives. More specifically, happy and successful people tend to spend less time planning and more time acting. They get out into the world, they try new things, make mistakes, and in doing so, they benefit from unexpected experiences and opportunities. So before we get into this, let's take a quick moment to check in. How about you? Are you already biasing towards action? Diving into things headfirst and learning as you go? Or are you someone who tends to sit back, plan, and find all the ways that something might fail without actually taking action towards it? If you're the former, this book is going to help you understand the strategy and why it's successful. If you're the latter, this book is going to show you how you can become more action focused and live a happier and more successful life because of it. Before we get into the big ideas that I've pulled out of the book, let's talk a little bit about mind mapping. To get the most out of these mind maps, you can do that by following along. You can find the process of how I mind map step by step plus all 50 plus mind map templates, including this one at the link down below. Following along will help you learn more, remember better, and apply these books to your life. And our first big idea here is fun meter. And I've highlighted this in blue because I think this is such a great thought exercise. Imagine that your uncle was a crazy inventor and his proudest accomplishment was the creation of a wrist-worn gadget called the fun meter. It records a measure and measures the degree of enjoyment you are experiencing. How enthusiastic, vital, curious, and appreciative you're feeling. It rates enjoyment on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being down in the dumps and 10 being as happy as can be. The stipulations of your uncle's will are the following. You are to wear the fun meter at all times. Each day, the fun meter will take the highest possible enjoyment reading that you got throughout the day and wirelessly tra transmit it to the estate's attorney's office. If the reading never falls below a value of seven over the course of the next year as your high watermark for the day, then you will receive $100 million. But if on any day, the high for the day falls below seven, then you will receive nothing. Let's say, for example, you decide to take on the challenge of wearing the fun meter. 
right away you are going to have to live life like it really matters. You can't let a single day pass without finding time to have at least a few moments of unadulterated joy. So here's the question. What action would you take on the first day? Now, when I first read this, it certainly sounded like a scam. It sounded like an email that I would get from a country that I don't usually frequent, but it's actually a great thought exercise. On any given day, what is your fun meter saying? Once you've got a good idea of what your meter is saying every single day, like for example, if you're at a three every single day, you know that you need to figure out a way to get up to that seven. Now, you need to know what could your meter be saying, right? So like what activities, what kind of thought patterns could you change so that you're constantly hitting the seven every single day? The guys in the book say that we should aim for a seven, obviously because, you know, 10 is feels unachievable, but this is pretty subjective, of course, and we don't actually have a fun meter. There's not actually a one to 10 meter that we're going to be wearing every single day. But in my estimation, it's a great way to bring mindfulness to our days. So for example, are we focusing on all the things that are currently stressing us out all day long and not having any time to actually have a little bit of fun? Are we neglecting ourselves in favor of working harder at some goal in the future without enjoying kind of the things that are going on around us today? Are we actively sabotaging our own fun meter in one of the many ways that humans tend to do? Are we focusing too much on the past? Are we focusing too much on the future? Are we forgetting to live in the moment a little bit each day? So the question you might be asking through this whole entire note is, how do I raise my fun meter? Personally, it's something that I've given quite a lot of thought over the years, and it seems to vary person to person, at least with the coaching clients that I deal with. A really insightful book all about this is The Myths of Happiness by Sonia Libermirsky. We've done a review of that on this channel, and if you're looking to dive a little bit deeper into this fun meter concept, I really recommend that book. Essentially, a lot of the things that we think make us happy actually won't. And it's better to go for smaller, consistent, happy bumps, like the daily fun meter, rather than the big ones. So those are the things that you want to think about. And again, if you want a little bit more information, you want to dive more into happiness as a concept and how you can accomplish or achieve a certain level of happiness, I really recommend The Myths of Happiness by Sonia Libomirsky. You can find that book on the channel as well. So next, let's talk about hitting the seven. Here's another quote that I pulled out of the book. They say, recall how energizing and rewarding it can be to really connect with somebody. Share, sharing a flow of thoughts and feelings of ease. As your day unfolds, seek out at least three opportunities to connect with others like this, with warmth, respect, and goodwill. Opportunities may spring up at home, at work, in your neighborhood, or out in your community. Wherever you are, open towards others. Freely offering your attention, creating a sense of safety through eye contact, conversation, or, when appropriate, touch. Share your own lighthearted thoughts and feelings and stay present as the other person shares theirs. Afterwards, lightly reflect on whether that interchange led you to feel the oneness of positivity resonance, even to a small degree. Creating the intention to seek out and create more micro moments of loving connection can be another tool for elevating your health and well-being, and of course, your happiness. I think what they're trying to say here is that quite often, more and more and more, we are so focused on our digital lives. And what's really important is the connection to other people that we run into on any given day. A lot of us think of ourselves as introvert, and I definitely include myself in that one as well. But having the habit of reaching out to people, having the habit of saying hi to the people on the street, not only does it make your day, but you're spreading happiness around. And that is really a positive benefit for the entire world. Our next big idea is success equals action. And here's where we really get into kind of the idea of fail fast and fail often. Well, like his, well we like his story because it points out an important principle. Successful people take action as quickly as possible, even though they may perform badly. Instead of trying to avoid mistakes and failing, they actively seek opportunities where they can learn quickly. 
they understand that feeling afraid or unprepared is actually a sign of being in the space for optimal growth and is all the more reason to press ahead. In contrast, when unsuccessful people feel unprepared or afraid, they interpret it as a sign that it's time to stop, readdress their plans, question their motives, or spend time preparing or planning. So in almost any endeavor, there's going to come a point where you're pushing up against the point where you're comfortable. And this concept of becoming comfortable in the uncomfortable is something that we've talked quite a lot about on the channel, something that we're all really would be best served to try and embody. If you're not a little bit uncomfortable with the actions that you're taking, if you're not a little bit uncomfortable with the goals that you're setting, if you're not a little bit uncomfortable with the habits that you're trying to build, likely the scenario means that you're probably staying put. You're probably not actually progressing and moving forward. In contrast, of course, there's people who are afraid of all change, and we really want to be wary of that. We all have that part inside of us, I believe. It takes a lot of practice to get comfortable being uncomfortable, but that's really what we should be chasing. Let us ask you some questions. When was the last time that you accomplished something that you were really proud of? How did you feel in the time before you reached this accomplishment? Was it comfortable, easy? Did you have things to do that pushed you beyond your abilities? And did you make mistakes and mess up? Of course, the last time that you accomplished something that you were really proud of, likely all those things were true. You had to push a little bit past where you were actually feeling comfortable, and you had to make a lot of mistakes along the way. If you're like most people, you will probably find that the times in your life when you grew and accomplished the most are also the times when you made the most mistakes and blunders and had to overcome your greatest obstacles. So again, I love that question of when was the last time that you accomplished something that you were really proud of. Likely, that accomplishment came after many, many different failures. Here are a couple from my life. I posted over 50 videos on this YouTube channel before anyone really started to pay attention. Now I'm over 100 videos and a few people are starting to pay attention and we're consistently growing each day. I must have called hundreds of businesses before anyone bought my marketing services. Those were both extremely difficult tasks to do when I wasn't seeing any rewards. But building both of those two businesses have been some of my greatest accomplishments in life. And of course, the putting a video up and no one looking at it and the hundreds of calls that I made before anyone actually bought any marketing services from me hurt in the moment. Of course, especially when you're first starting out and you're not actually sure if what you're doing is going to work. Often we've got a hope of creating something great without failing. And of course, I actually kind of dug a big trench for myself when I was starting my marketing business by trying to come up with the greatest plan of all time. We think that the plan that we've created is going to be foolproof and won't need to be iterated on. And of course, that's almost never the case. The idea that you're first starting with, especially in business, is almost never the idea that actually is successful for you. But failure is the best learning opportunity. Of course, I could iterate on my plan without having actual feedback from businesses. I wouldn't know if I was changing the thing that they wanted me to change or if I was changing something that literally didn't matter to them. So the best way to get learning opportunities is to get out there, put yourself out there, and fail along the way. Of course, we'd do better in the long and short term to just make a lot of attempts and iterate along the way. When starting a business, you're going to have to change your offering dozens and dozens of times before you find success. Journeys to personal growth often come with a lot of failure. First, you set your goals, and then you realize that habits are important. And then finally, you realize that it comes down to attention. Of course, then the cycle starts all over again. Personal growth is a never-ending journey of trying something and failing and trying something and succeeding, trying something and failing and continuing on with that journey. The number one thing that you can do to become successful faster is just be willing to fail. Don't spend all of your time outside of the arena planning. Instead, get in the arena, fail if you have to, and learn along the way. Our next idea here is bad equals good. And again, this one is highlighted because I just think it's so, so, so important. They are willing to fail time and time again in order to get their bearings, move forward, and to learn. Successful people understand that the best way to learn about something and get good at it is to fail fast 
as it is so they can fail as fast as they can. Since every significant accomplishment is preceded by flops, bad ideas, false starts, and failed efforts, these people are willing to fail as quickly and as often as possible to get it out of the way. Instead of studying, preparing, and delaying so as to avoid making mistakes, they find ways to immediately take action, create or do something even though they know their efforts will fail short of perfection or even minimal competency, especially when you're first starting out. Since success is usually preceded by bumbling starts and botched efforts, you can think about anything you would like to succeed at in terms of how you must first be bad at it. So you can put it in this form. If I want to succeed at blank, I must first be bad at blank. And really, I think this matches up so well with Grit by Angela Duckwork. If you haven't checked out that book, I recommend you go and look at it on the channel. Really, really great book. And what she says inside her book is that the formula for achievement is talent times effort equals skill. Skill times effort equals achievement. So of course, the whole entire formula is looking at achievement. We often think that talent is the most important part in any single talent and skill are the most important part of any equation when it comes to achievement and success. But really what she says is that effort counts twice. Effort is the most important part of the equation. Every time we step up to the plate and make, our, make an effort, we get the chance to be more skilled. If we're making videos, each one gives us a chance to learn. If you're making marketing pitches, each one gives you a chance to learn. And this makes failure just a little bit easier, knowing that each swing you take can have a chance to become better. And I love this quote from the book, Be Unstoppable by Alden Mills. Again, another great book, recommending a lot today, but I recommend you check this one out as well. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not, because nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. And of course, persistence and determination are what leads to us taking action and being willing to fail. The too long didn't read of that entire book is no matter where you start, action and persistence are the two most important parts of the success equation. Although that's a really great book, I recommend that you go and check out Grit and Be Unstoppable, both already on the channel. Between the lines of this passage, to me, hides the truth. The truth here is that failure is certainly part of the achievement equation, right? Achievement, we're trying to achieve anything. Failure is a part of this equation. The effort, the failing, the kind of iterating is all part of the equation. But only failure that we learn from is actually worthwhile. Of course, we all know a lot of people that are determined and they're doing the same thing over and over and over again without success because they're not changing their approach. So in my opinion, we should be also asking ourselves, how are we learning from our failures? Yes, I'm going to be determined. I'm going to be persistent. I'm going to set out to fail as often as, and as quickly as I possibly can, but I need to learn from my failures. So for my example, this would be a post-mortem analysis of any project or action that you take. Step number one is of course, take the action. You wanna know the desired outcome and then just get busy going. Step number two is to try your hardest and follow your plan. Make sure that you're staying determined and persistent on the actions that you say that you're going to take. But step number three is to ask the stoic questions. And this is coming directly from Think Like a Roman Emperor, uh, a book all about Marcus Aurelius by Donald Robertson. Really great book available on the channel. Go and check that one out as well. Add that one to your list. He said that we ask three different questions at the end of the day, three different journaling questions. Number one is to what went well? What did I do well today? Or what did I do well in the actions that I took to try and lead towards my goal? Step number two is what didn't go well? So we want to acknowledge that not everything is perfect and that we know that we need to set out and learn from our failures. What didn't go well? It's a great question to ask. And of course, our last question is what can I do better next time? What can I do better next time? So you go from the positive, what went well, even the fact that you tried is often a really great answer to that question. What didn't go well? What are a few of the reasons that you failed, for example? 
And then what can I do better next time? How can I remedy some of those reasons that I ended up failing so that when I try again, I have a higher likelihood of achieving it. And then of course, if you follow the persistence, you follow the grit formula, and you continually iterate on your ideas and your actions, failure is not an option, in the end at least. Our next idea here is called small steps. It can be difficult to get started on big projects, such as changing your career path, reorganizing your office, or establishing a healthier lifestyle. When you find yourself becoming paralyzed because you're unsure of how to proceed, it is a time to stop worrying about your difficult goals and to focus instead on finding one small thing to do. No matter how confused or chaotic your life may be, you can always find one positive step to take. By taking that first step, you get things moving and open yourself up to new opportunities, making it easier to take the next step. So what next step would you like to take? It could be anything that will allow you to learn, explore, or make progress at something that's important to you. The point is to get moving and make things happen, not to strive for a significant accomplishment. The smaller and easier the step, the better. One of the hallmarks of the small wins approach is that you often don't know where your actions will lead. So don't worry about trying to follow a linear path. Just have fun taking lots of little steps and enjoy the surprise of being led to unexpected places. So this is something that I deal with quite a lot inside of my coaching practice is that having a big goal or vision, while it's definitely a good thing, it can oftentimes be paralyzing. Often it can feel like that big idea or big vision is so far away that it seems pointless to even start, even if you know where to start. This is something that, of course, like I said, a lot of my coaching clients deal with. It's why they come to see me. They have this big vision, this grand vision of what they want to do, and that's really awesome. But they end up getting stuck in a couple of different places. Number one, they aren't sure how to get there. Often they have a plan, but they're just not sure that it would work. And even if they've taken a few different steps, they're not sure that they're actually moving towards what they want to accomplish. Number two is that they're afraid to get started in case they don't get any rewards that they imagine. So they've got this big idea of what they want, this grand vision, and they're going to start following along the path that they've kind of laid out for themselves, but they're afraid that they're not going to get any rewards. They're afraid that their plan isn't going to work. So how do we overcome the paralyzing effect of those big dreams? For me and for my coaching clients is to focus on only the steps that are actually in front of you. Together, we follow these three steps. Step number one is to understand the why behind what you're looking to accomplish. Oftentimes, this is actually more important than the what. So if you have a good, strong why you want to accomplish something, it almost doesn't even matter what the what is. The what kind of serves as a, a goalpost of sorts, but again, if you look at it and it paralyzes you, it's really not a good way to motivate yourself. Instead, I recommend that you look at the deeper underlying why. What's the purpose of trying to accomplish this thing that I'm setting out to do? And once you have that, that's extremely motivating and it'll keep you going through the rocky spots. Step number two is to forget completely about the what, especially if this is something that's bothering you, you're feeling paralyzed, you're feeling like you can't make any progress towards your goal. Measuring yourself against your ideal does not serve you. You're constantly going to be seeing how far away this big grand vision is, and you're constantly going to be feeling bad about yourself, zapping your morale, and stopping you from going out and actually accomplishing your goal. Step number three that I work through with my clients is to follow the next two to three steps that you know that you can take. Learn from them and take a few more steps. So for example, a lot of people come to me when they want to first start a YouTube channel. They want to know how I've done it, how I'm monetizing such a small channel to such a large degree. And often what I say is, how many videos have you posted? And the answer more often than not is zero. So if you're starting a YouTube channel, wouldn't the first step be to create a video? And wouldn't it be to put something out there in the world and get a little bit of feedback, to potentially fail and learn a little bit from it? Of course, that is the right answer, but often we focus too much on, can I set up the perfect system in order to have the exact right business, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot more information on my approach to this and where I learned a lot of this from in the four disciplines of execution, lag versus lead measures. I recommend that you go and check out that book on the channel. 
If you're struggling with this sort of thing, I do have some coaching spots available down below in the description. I would be happy to help you get past your sticking point. Now, how about you? Let's find your next steps. I'll give you a quick example. Yeah, I want to create a million view per year YouTube channel and share the things that I've learned with other people. That's kind of my what part of my goal, my grand vision, so to speak. It fulfills me more than anything else in life. And that's really my why. It's extremely fulfilling to share these ideas with you people. When you reach out in the comments and let me know that it actually helped you, it's just the best feeling in the world. And that's why I've set out on this journey. Step number two is I simply don't look at my analytics every single day. I used to do that. I used to see, okay, I got exactly this amount of viewers. I got exactly this amount of ad revenue. I got exactly this many course sales, et cetera, et cetera. And that was absolutely toxic to my own personal mental health. It made me really hate actually making videos instead of focusing on what I truly cared about, which was creating the videos. So each day I now focus one hour of reading and 30 minutes of mapping. Those are my lead measures and it allows me to get a few books done every single week. That's really what I focus on. I do not focus on how many likes I'm getting on a video. I don't focus on how many subscribers and that sort of thing because it just creates a toxic environment for me and doesn't lead to success. Now I recommend that you pause the video, download the mind map and take a couple of minutes. Follow the three steps below. What's your big idea? What's your goal? And what's your why behind it? What are some of these small steps that you can take to actually accomplish that goal and ideally do it daily? Our final point here is failure isn't going to be fun. Failure does not equal fun. Here you might be saying, well, all this talk sounds nice enough, but no matter how you spin it, it's still no fun to fail. It's certainly true that no matter how positive minded you try to be, it can be painful when things don't work out the way you want, when your application isn't accepted at an elite school, you don't get the job, your artwork isn't taken by the gallery, your business doesn't catch on, or you find that you aren't as talented as you hoped. When this happens, it is going to feel disappointing. It may make you doubt your intelligence, your abilities, your ideas, and that's okay. It's a short lived pain that will go away. This is nothing compared to the fear of failure, which drains your vitality and paralyzes you from taking action that brings you joy and meaning into your life. And really, I just wanted to underscore this, that sure, failure isn't going to be fun, which might seem like we've come this whole entire way from saying life should be all fun and we should hit that seven on the funnel meter every single day to life is full of failure and that's not going to be fun, right? Those feel like two diametrically opposed ideas. But for me, the ideas actually mix together. Making sure that we're having fun in life and committing to getting better at things that we can go, that those two things can go together. Essentially, the idea that I'm having here is that if you're going to chase things, if you're going to be willing to fail, you should be focusing a little bit on what's making me happy in the moment. Quite often, I think we let some grand idea of what our future is going to look like be the thing that we're building our happiness upon. And especially when we're not taking action, it can feel like, of course, we're stuck in this stasis, this groundhog day continually. But I think what the people in the book have done really, really well is say, you need to be happy today. How are you going to accomplish that? And you need to take action today, even if you don't know what the outcome will be. So those two ideas to me mix pretty well together. And I'll leave you a quote from the book. It is natural to feel uncertain, unmotivated, or fearful when facing new challenges, but negative feelings shouldn't stop you. The best way to gain confidence and improve your mood is to take action. Even though you're not feeling up to it, the next time that you find yourself hesitating due to your negative mood, get going anyway. Go for a run, even though you feel lethargic, invite a colleague to lunch, even though you feel shy, Volunteer for a project, even though you doubt your abilities, or enroll in a challenging course, even though you feel unprepared. Now it's time for you to get out there and fail as quickly as possibly can, and then fail again. Of course, failure, as we spoke about before, is the only way to succeed. I want to thank you for being with me here in this video. If you're interested in getting a little bit of a shortcut, if you want to learn more about goal setting or habits or purpose, those sorts of topics, 
you can find my master classes, which are essentially dozens of books distilled down into one two hour long master class available at themindmapguy.com. I hope to see you there in the master classes and also in the next video.